messages continue on or keep on keeping on. Amen? Huh? Keep on keeping on. There's a lot of times in our life we go through things and we don't feel like keeping on keeping on, do we? <laughs> we like to throw in the towel, just give up, run away, hide. And uh, when we come to that in our thinking, uh, we're in good company because most people feel that way sometimes. But also, uh, even King David felt that way. He said, you remember if I had wings, like he said, I'd fly away. And when I got away, I'm not coming back. He just wanted to get away from everything that was going on in his life. And sometimes we come to that because of the trials that hit us and uh, the tribulation that comes our way, and it's not always easy. We know that. In America, most believers, they desire, they expect, they hope <laughs> that their trip to heaven will be smooth and uneventful. That's what most people would like to have. But unfortunately, there are a lot of teaching within so-called Christianity that's saying just the opposite. You watch uh, the Christian media, and they've misled a lot of believers, lost people into thinking that the Christian life should be fun. Nothing wrong with fun, by the way, but always fun, a breeze on the mountaintop, free from any tribulations, free from any storms in one's life. Often we hear that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He wants to give you happiness, prosperity, wealth, health, and the abundant life. And it's interesting to me as they speak that and say that to people, they still want the money to go to their individual ministry, don't they? To me, anyway, that's interesting. They offer a happy, positive, financial, easy gospel and most all problems will be resolved and you'll have a wonderful life it's there it's just waiting for you if you would just come and claim it they have the ability to be able to entice people with having everything that the people humanly desire and sometimes these people they go forward and become a part of that ministry that philosophy that's going on, and uh, uh, they go forward for that, but they don't go forward for the message that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. Amen. They don't go forward to receive a message that in your life you're going to have some tribulations and you're going to have some sufferings and trials that do come our way. They, when they go forward, they find a religion, a feeling, some type of experience or some fantasy hope of all their problems being solved. But they're not looking for the new life in Christ nor biblical view of the real life. A spiritual application would be there's a blind man walking. He's headed toward a, kit, a cliff. It's a 1,000 feet over the edge of down, 1,000 feet. And Christendom comes along and says, listen, God wants you to have a wonderful life. Uh, he wants you to be at peace. He wants you to enjoy your life now. And they give him a Walkman with adjustable earphones. And he hears the tune Amazing Grace. So he said, well, boy, these people are right. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be at peace. I'm supposed to enjoy this. And he shakes their hands and he thanks them for what they've said. And he continues tapping alone since he's blind. And he comes to the edge of the cliff. And he falls over the edge of the cliff down a thousand feet to his death. And he dies. And we ask the question, what had been, what had been done? Well, their message, it failed to awaken that blind man to what is true and his true plight. They gave him a false hope and a false peace. Because I say to you this morning, what does the, why does a person need to be saved? What are they being saved from? And you just don't hear that a whole lot today. Many are given the hope of salvation, but 
not making them aware of their sinfulness. They're violating God's laws. They stand, all of us as sinners, stand guilty, lost, condemned. Judgment is coming. And their need is Christ and the gospel of grace. And the reason they need to believe in that is because they are lost sinners on their way to hell. When's the last time you've heard, as you watch TV, outside of a couple, thank God for them, that ever mentioned you're rotten sinners and you need a savior. You need to be saved from your sin, or if not, you're going to hell. People need to hear the truth. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go away, the comforter uh, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of what? Sin, their sin. And then you can talk about the righteousness of God and the judgment that's coming. Their righteousness doesn't measure up, and as a result of that, judgment is coming upon their life. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 says this, Now we know that what, th uh, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, now get this, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Lost people are guilty before God. And that sin will send them to hell one day. It states in 1 Timothy 1.9, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers, murders of mothers, for manslayers. When's the last time you heard people being told that truth? Huh? When you watch the TV media. I mean, you just don't see it in many Christian circles anymore. Likewise, many are given hope of their everyday life of having abundant joy, of wealth, of health, most problems being solved without the tribulations and the storms that's being promised them by these speakers. There's never any acknowledgement of their sinfulness and lostness. It doesn't do you any good just to say a little prayer if you don't know why or what you're praying about. Amen? You have to acknowledge you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. You have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ loves you so much he died on the cross for your sins and they buried him and three days later he broke the chains of death and he's alive. And what he's accomplished is enough to wash away all your sins but you're being saved from your sinfulness and going to hell because of what Christ has accomplished. That's what you need to believe in your heart. The truth is, Romans 4, 25, who was delivered for our offenses, our sins, and was raised again for our justification. Then chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified, how? By faith in what Christ has accomplished. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that is salvation. And then there is, for the believer, suffering. Verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in what? Tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Being saved and having tribulation, that is the real life of a true believer. Amen? That's, that's life. And sometimes, by the way, life is not fair to us. You can't walk around here all the time, oh, I'm so happy, oh, I'm so happy. I'm full of joy. I'm going to have, I'm a, I'm gonna have a million dollars one day. I've claimed that by faith. Unbelievable. I've met some of them. 2 Corinthians 1, 7, and our hope, of you is steadfast, knowing that ye are partakers of the sufferings. So shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant 
of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. Have you ever despaired even of life? It's tough what's going on. You know, Paul did. He went through all of that. Real life is the fact that we live in a fallen, sinful world. We live in a fallen, sinful body that produces storms and tribulations and sufferings. And then when this happens to these people that's been promised the world and health and wealth and all these things, their questions arise. Why, God? Where is God? This isn't supposed to happen to me. I'm a Christian. God's supposed to protect me, provide for me. That's what the preacher says, the word says. In reality, they've not been told the truth or learned the truth. The biblical truth is every, even all, every believer, all believers, we do suffer. We suffer illnesses hardships, difficulties, hurts, loss, storms, personal attacks, the world's attacks, our own bodies going downhill, its burdens. And on top of that, then there are spiritual attacks. Huh? You know, uh, it's because we live in a satanic-led, sinful, evil, fallen world system controlled by the devil. And the devil is the God of this world. And boy, he knows how to attack us personally or persecution, whatever it might be. And he hates God and he hates his followers. And so he attacks us and he's relentless. He doesn't give up, does he? So there's no one, no life that misses suffering or pain some way. And by the way, when it happens, it's no fun, is it? I mean, there's just no fun whatsoever. I don't like to be hurt, do you? I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. But it comes, and it's not very enjoyable. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution." I believe that's one of the reasons that the new movements being uh, progressivism and a lot of those things, they try to stay as close to the world as they possibly can so they can be accepted by the world. Rather than living godly, sanctified, separated, holy lives. Because there's a price to pay when you live for Christ. Amen? I didn't get many on that, God. That's okay. If we only say God wants us to have a wonderful, abundant, happy, prosperous life. Let's throw away the Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs, let's just throw that away. Throw Hebrews chapter 11 out the Bible. I was thinking, uh, I come across him the other day on the internet, but I remember when I was a student at Temple, there was a guy who came through, Richard Wormbrand, and he wrote Tortured for Christ. And he gave some details about what he went through. And I'm thinking, he went through all that just because he would not deny his faith. Because he loved God. And we're going to go through that. What happened to John the Baptist? Did they have a cup of tea and let him go? What did they do to him? They chopped his head off. What did they do to Jesus Christ? And he's our example. They crucified him. What happened to the 12 apostles? Huh? They were all persecuted. What's happening to the believers, whether it's the Sudan or Africa, Nigeria, the Middle East, the Muslim Middle East, China? China right today is really, really cracking down on believers there. And they don't have open churches where everybody comes. They have underground churches, and they're being attacked, attacked, and attacked. 200,000 people lose their lives. They're martyred for their faith each and every year. A prayer that's guaranteeing heaven, abundancy, prosperity, happiness, a wonderful plan for your lives, no tribulation, problems always solved, that's a myth. Huh? That is just a myth. 
even when the great apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, the fellow by the name of Ananias, God told him about Paul. Acts chapter 9 verse 16 says this, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul's the one who said, Be ye followers of me. Amen? Later we see Paul uh, and he's in jail. And he's in jail for his faith. And we say to Paul, Paul, where's all your friends? I don't see any of your friends here. And, and by the way, your faith, they're going to chop your head off. You're facing execution. And Paul lifts his bloody head and beaten body. And he says in 2 Timothy 4, 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. I read that sometimes, and I think of all the people Paul touched. I think of the ones he led to Christ. I think of the ones that, as an apostle, he performed miraculous deeds. I think of all the churches he started there in Asia Minor, and hardly anybody coming by just except for a handful, a seam in prison. But Paul, he, then he says, hey, it's okay. You see, my life revolved around Christ and the cross, and the empty tomb. And because I've identified with that, he suffered, I've learned how much he must have suffered through my sufferings. It gives me a little taste of what he must have gone through. But through it all, I've learned this, he cares for you. I've learned that regardless of what I've been through, and I've been through it, Paul says, he's always stood right beside me. And he stayed faithful. In life as a believer, we do have heartaches, we have sufferings. And God asks us today, will we as his children, while we're in the midst of our storm, will we continue in following in Christ? Will we continue to trust him, worship him, serve him? Even I'm going through hell on earth right now, will I keep on keeping on? Our storms, our suffering are the ultimate test of our faith. Will we continue to trust him? When the bottom falls out, when it doesn't make sense and it hurts so bad, when it seems impossible to handle, seemingly overwhelming, will I still believe and trust him? I've said before, we're good at telling Others, when they're going through their trials, oh, just trust the Lord. And then it's our time. And it's our trial. And all of a sudden, things change a little bit. We begin to have a little doubt while we're going through our trial. And you know, the doubt actually is not about God. The doubt is about us. Are we going to continue to trust him no matter what? And the truth is, we can. We can trust him and worship him and praise him and serve him, even in the midst of the craziest trials or tribulations or storms that we face in our life. And the reason it, it's because regardless of our circumstances, those circumstances never change the truth about God. Job teaches us that in our difficulties, he says this in Job 10, 12. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Job is saying this, our God is still good. No matter what we go through, and he went through it, our God is still good. Not only that, Job teaches us our God is still powerful. Job chapter 36, verse 5. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Verse 22, behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? Our God is still powerful. And not only that, our God is still in control. Job 37, God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. 
For he saith to the snow, be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain and to the great rain of his strength. Verse 12, and it is turned round about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. Our God is still good. Our God is still powerful. Our God is still in control regardless of the circumstances we're going through. Regardless of what the world and the devil is trying to attack us and pull us away, God says even that is with limitations. Uh, it's only that if I allow, they can only go so far in your life. And so the lesson, the truth is, not until we go through our dark valleys, our sufferings and our pain, do we truly know the awfulness of sin and the graciousness of a wonderful God. Our God, he's real, he's faithful in all of our storms. Remember Paul, he's the one who says, all those forsook me. Later on, the next two verses says, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Some people believe that lion's the devil. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, even though they mean it for evil, God meant it for good, and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and forever. Amen? Listen, it's when we see others going through the ringer who have faith in God and they courageously stand for that faith, it's then that lost people begin to truly understand the greatness of our God and his grace. We have people in our church, wonderful, wonderful testimonies. And they've been through the ringer. Whether it's Beryl Johnson, who has been through heart surgery and everything, the next week he's right in his place. Whether it's Rose Goldsby, little munchkin. She's been fighting cancer for five years. But when the church door is open, if at all possible, she's right in her place, trusting in her God. We have Diane... Higgins now, and she's going through some things. Saw her this morning smiling, trusting God. We have a program here called Grief Share, and we have people go through who have lost loved ones. And boy, we can only imagine how painful and hurtful that is. But they, you know, it's a hit. But some way, somehow, God interjects his grace in their hearts and life. And they stay, and they're here today. Amen. What wonderful, that's our time to shine. When all hell is breaking loose all around us, we say, I believe in God. Amen. Amen. When Stephen was being stoned to death, he glowed in faith. They threw his clothes down at another man, and because he glowed in faith, I believe it talked. To the man, they threw those clothes down by the name of Saul of Tarsus. It states in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was, that's Saul, who became the great apostle Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. In the midst of his greatest storm, his faith, he said, I will believe. I will trust God. And they're stoning him to death. God wants us to have a faith that stands up and says, I believe in God. God says this, yes, at times it's tough but I want you to continue on trusting me. Yes, at times you might even fail, but get up, continue on, and keep on going. And one day it will be worth it. 
Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Everything's going great, and then finally you receive a phone call. And there is a hurt, a suffering in your family. The tears begin to come. You even perhaps weep. You're trying to make sense of it, but then God takes us to faith in him. And he reminds us that his ways and his thoughts are a lot higher than ours. That's why we don't know the outcomes. He does. That's why we need to trust him. And at the end of it all, we have to come to the same bottom line conclusion as Peter did. It states in John 6, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with Christ. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Who in the, else, who in the world else, in the world you're going to turn to? There's only one person you can, and that's Christ himself. And that's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. Yeah, I'm suffering, but I'm going to keep on going. Why? Because I believe in the one who's made his promises to me. Amen. Now I'm about done. Thank you for not saying amen. Do you know that God also hates our pain and our suffering? God knows it's not normal and it's not right, but it's the result of sin that came into our world. But God has moved. At the cost, great cost to himself, he had to watch his only son die on a cross for it. Huh? And God's plan is this here. His plan is to remove all the sin from us and all of his creation. That's his plan he's going to fulfill one day. States in Romans chapter 8, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Creation, the animals... They groan. Sin has had effect even on, on creation. They groan for deliverance and redemption. And we likewise. One day, we who believe will have our glorified bodies. We won't have to worry about this old body that's corrupt and decaying. We'll have a great body one of these days. The thing I want to leave you with you this morning is we do find comfort and encouragement through God's love for us, through his word that gives us our promises. But our greatest hope is our future. Our future hope is such an encouragement because it reminds us that this life is only temporary and we have a future life one day. Notice these verses, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Get a hold of that. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Our hope is the fact that Christ, being the first to die, be buried, and rise in a glorified body, he's the first with others to come. We're the others, we who have believed. Even death cannot stop our future. Now look, think these verses, Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation, my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. How could it be gain if you die? It's more of Christ. Personally seeing him face to face. Chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, 
from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. One day, it will be worth it all. That's why Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed what? Hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is our hope. Yeah, God blesses us. He gives us great times in this life here, but also he allows great suffering and pain because of the fall. All of that, but one day, all the bad stuff's going to be behind us, and it's all going to be good. You never know when you're going to be in a crisis. I think about the duck boat this past week, and I think about the Coleman family in Branson, Missouri, 11 family members getting on a duck boat that, you know, can go on, on the road but also in the water. And that unexpected, unknown storm arises and the waves get high. <clears throat> I heard the one wife, mom, say she was in the boat and she had her son <clears throat> next to her and then she didn't feel him anymore. And she said, I got to get out of here. She was underwater. It ended up nine of the 11 family members perished in that duck boat this week. And I'm trying to say, God, I hope they're believers. You know, I, 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 that means everything right then. And I heard her give a testimony about her God. Broken hearted but she was still trusting God. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Her pastor of a Baptist, NU something Baptist church, he says, you know, we yield to the sovereign will of God for her life, for her families. But we also know this God, that in this great human tragedy, it seems like, that God has a purpose in everything. And that same God is the one that they are leaning up on at this time. And I say to you, I don't know what you're going through, but I do know this. We have a God who loves us and cares for us. And he knows we suffer. He knows what we go through. He knows when the very next sparrow falls to the ground. And don't you think he cares more for you? He does. And so I say to you this morning, continue on in your faith. Keep on going. Don't give up. Keep your faith. Trust him more. You know, before Abraham ever offered up Isaac, he had passed, we, they have counted them, 25 other tests that God gave him before he ever came to that great test. God wants to use us, but we have to learn going through these trials and sufferings so that we can be stronger because God has something greater for us to do. We love you, but more important than that, God loves you. Amen. Father, we love you this morning. We're thankful that even in the midst of suffering and trials, we're grateful that we have a God, the God of this Bible, Jehovah God. We have a God who cares, who loves, who works with us and takes us through the dark days as well as the high days. Always with us, just like Paul. As Paul said, he delivered me out of every trial. Thank you for being such a great God. I pray that you have your hand up on the people this morning. Encourage their hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. 
For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you as our prayer.